Whew, I've been up since like six something this morning. So actually I slept decently. Thank God. Um, I'm dog sitting for the week. And so of course the dog had to, she's been really quiet. I'm surprised she hasn't tried to come in here and snuggle. Um, <laughs> she has to get up and go potty before, you know, before the sun comes up and what she's not gonna do is potty in my house. So she, she woke me up a little earlier this morning and she was like, girl, I gotta go. So I took her out for a 40 minute walk this morning. It was nice. You know, once I'm the type of person, I'm not, I be struggling in the morning. Okay. Struggling. I get up and I feel like death warmed up. I'm not even, it takes me a while to come to, but once I'm up, I'm up. And you know, one thing I do want to do is I wish I could get up earlier in the mornings, especially around weekends, just because I feel like I need to tap into those hours. I'm not talking about those, that 5 a.m. team. No, I might, I, I need to, cause I didn't need to sleep anymore. I'd slept, I'd slept a good seven hours. So anyway, you don't need to watch me processing this. Hi, my name's Alana. Welcome to my YouTube channel. On this channel, we review books. This book review is, or this book, this book review, this video is going to be a book review of The Goldfinch by Donna Tart. Um, so The Goldfinch is a book. Okay, cool. The Goldfinch is a book that I actually tried to read back in 2014. I was a very different reader in 2014 than I am now. My reading has evolved a lot. My recreational reading has evolved a lot. I used to actually only read for enjoyment. I'm not saying that you can't enjoy this book, but I didn't really read it to analyze. Maybe every now and then I would see a quote that I liked and mark it or, oh, I see what the author's doing. I see how this is linking to this, but I really read for enjoyment and just for the fun of it. And so I also picked my narratives based on that. I've read way more like lush historical fiction at that time. And I think it's because by 2014, I was finished with university, but just barely. I've not even been out for a year uh, ish. When did I graduate? I had me now when I picked that book up, I had not I, maybe had I been out for a year, maybe. And so my history degree and my sociology degree, I had to read so much dense content so that when I read for fun or for, for recreation, I picked the fun stuff and I picked stuff that I knew was horribly, horribly written, but I just wanted to just get immersed into a world. And so I was still kind of lingering in that mindset, which is fine. Within about a year or two after I, I had graduated from university, just because my brain was fried. I'm not going to lie. I read some dense stuff in college. So when I read The Goldfinch, I was like, I just don't, I was just not feeling it. It was boring. It was slow. I wanted something fast paced and fun. And The Goldfinch was not it. Beautifully written. I knew it was well written when I picked it up. I was just like, nope, not today. And so I decided to give it a second chance because sometimes it's not the book. It's you. It was me. So I reread it. I started at the end of 2023 and finished it halfway through January of this year. And I'm glad I did because I finished it and I enjoyed it. And I, we have some things to talk about. This book is infamous, is it not? People love or hate the Goldfinch though. It is one of those books that you love or you hate it. Period. I just so happen to really enjoy it. Not a five, but I did give it a four out of five. Let's just put that out there. How strange to find that the present contained such a bright shard of the living past, damaged and eroded, but not destroyed. So in The Goldfinch, uh, our main character and narrator, Theo, loses his mother in a tragic accident at the age of 13 in New York City. Um, the tragic accident is like an act of terrorism and there's this explosion that goes off and it's, it's just a massive turning point in, in his life, as you could imagine. And this shock thrusts Theo into this chaotic childhood. So then he gets, um, he has to go live with his father in Las Vegas. And, you know, he stays there for a time. And then he does end up navigating his way back to New York City. And... By the time the book ends, Theo is in his, I want to say his early to mid twenties, and he's still just kind of rattled by what has happened to him and the, the shocking depth 
death of his mother, he was very close to his mother. And so that just left a wound that will never be filled for this character. And so you can, his life is just kind of at these, it's in the shambles in a way, even from the outside looking in, he looks okay, but he is shattered because one, he was in an explosion. And so he's navigating these wealthy circles in some ways, but he's also a part of the underground. I don't want to say too much more because he, that would spoil some stuff, but he's also holding on to a priceless piece of art. Remember, this is called the goldfinch. This is a famous piece of art from a Dutch painter. And he obtains this famous priceless piece of piece of art and it goes with him from the time of this explosion to blah 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 and holding on to this piece of art that has is being searched for since this explosion does lead him into the underground art world and a little bit of criminal a little bit a little bit of criminal activity (laughs) so the impact of theo's mother's death is something that permeates the entire novel as I said it's a hole for Theo that will never be filled and Tart highlights just how devastating death and grief can be to a person so Theo goes through his life and he's narrating it and there's just constant veil of mourning it shadows overshadows the whole book How was it possible to miss someone as much as I missed my mother? I missed her so much I wanted to die. A hard physical longing, like a craving for air underwater. It kept being a shock every time I remembered it. A fresh slap, she was gone. Every new event, everything I did for the rest of my life, would only separate us more and more. Days she was no longer a part of. An ever-growing distance between us. Every single day for the rest of my life, she would only be further away. But sometimes, unexpectedly, grief pounded over me in waves that left me gasping. And when the waves washed back, I found myself looking out over a brackish, that's a hard word for, brackish, brackish, there it is, not brackish, brackish, (laughs) wreck, which was illumined by a light so lucid, so heartsick and empty that could hardly remember that the world had ever been anything but dead. This, uh, Donna Tart is such a, She's such a good writer. And by that, I mean, when it comes to details, Um, I've read the secret history. I haven't read, is it the little friend? Yeah, I haven't read a little friend or the little friend by her yet, but she leaves these needles in a haystack and it is very overt what she's talking, what she's doing when it comes to grief. It is one of the main, if not the main themes of the book, but she leaves these little breadcrumbs that are quite subtle that show how Theo will never get out of mourning. So one of the main ones that I noticed was that, again, if you play close enough attention, Lily's is const- Lily's, the flower, is consistent as, Im- as an image throughout the whole novel post his mother's death. And lilies are actually often a flower that are displayed at funerals and so there are times when theo will see a lily and he may even say that there is a lily at a funeral he'll smell lilies in some cases but it's throughout the whole novel and sometimes you can miss it or something will be mentioned like lily of the valley yea do i walk through the valley of the shadow of death right so which is in a psalm. So there is just so much subtlety. It's blatant, but subtle at the same time, depending on the sentence, right? So that's just something I wanted to point out that Lily's falls under this theme of grief and death. So losing a parent, as you can imagine, is beyond difficult, especially when you lose a parent in a tragic accident that's completely unexpected at a young age and Theo and because Theo is also involved in this accident he has to process the sudden loss of his mother and being involved in a violent attack himself in making it out alive PTSD 
is also a theme that is constant in this novel. The worst thing about the explosion was how I carried it in my body. Did she have nightmares too? Crowd fears, sweats and panics. Did she ever have the sense of observing herself from afar, as I often did, as if the explosion had knocked my body and my soul into two separate entities that remained about six feet apart from one another? The she that he's referring to here is a young girl that was also involved in this accident and she made it out alive and she lost a close loved one in that incident as well. And so Theo is a character that also has substance abuse issues, alcohol and drugs. And all of it is stemming from grief and PTSD. And there is an arc with this though, if you stick with the character toward at the end of this 700 plus page book, there is an arc of that. There is an arc here. And even this she that he's referring to, I forgot the girl's name off the top of my head. <laughs> she seems in a lot of ways, like she has it all together from the outside in. She's successful when it comes to academics and what have you, but like attracts like and Theo is able to see in her that she has some issues. She's not as strong as she seems. She has her moments. And so, um, Donna Tart is hammering home how you just don't get over something like this. Or yes, you may move on and you may heal to an extent, but it never fully leaves you. It leaves you changed for the rest of your life. And um, how other people often just don't understand. So that was one thing I wanted to touch on when it came, when it came to reading this book. I will say that unlike with the secret history, the secret history for me was a lengthy review. Maybe I, I hoped to reread The Secret History this year. I might not get to it, but I still have a review for it. And maybe I'll, either way, if I read it or not, if I read it this year, I'll redo, I'll update the review. If I don't read it this year, I'll do a review for it anyway, perhaps, if I feel like it. <laughs> there is something about, what was it? There was something about the goldfinch I was, I was reading it that I just didn't feel the need to just dive into the themes too much. I felt like the themes were pretty straightforward, <laughs> pretty straightforward. And so there wasn't really, it was there, take it and, and discuss it with a few quotes and move on. But one thing I also wanted to touch on was when Theo gets back to New York City, he gets involved with restoring antiques, especially furniture. And this is very symbolic for Theo because he's stuck in a lot of ways, he's stuck in the past. It's this demarcation. The incident, previous to the incident with his mother and then post incident where his mother is gone. And so Theo is drawn to the old. He's drawn to nostalgia because in the past, are the things that were good that was in his life I'm shaking and the setup and so it's symbolic and blatant <laughs> that he has latched on to restoring antiques because it's this preservation of the old to retain the old to retain memories contrasted with new or contemporary items that just don't seem to hold up so for example for Theo, he still lives in this haze, the glow of when his mother was alive, which is understandable, but the present just never fully does it. The, the present will never be as good for him as the past because his mother is not there to experience it with him. And Theo in this book will sometimes complain about how new designs, New furniture, contemporary furniture, it's just not up to furniture, it's just not up to par, it's not as well made anymore. You know, we live in a society that likes to get rid of the old and replace it for the new, the modern, where for what, right? And sometimes, you know, we live in a society that's willing to tear down old buildings and old structures that are beautifully made for things that are sleek and modern and actually not architecturally interesting. They're just cop carbon copies of each other. Yeah, you think that it'd be protected, wouldn't you? Nice old place. Yesterday I had to jackhammer up the marble stair, ja jackhammer up the marble, marble stairs 
in the lobby. Remember those stairs? Real shame. Wish we could have got him out whole. You don't see that quality marble so much like you used to. The nice old marble like that. I just pulled that one quote because it was pretty uh, evident that one quote would be done to get that point across. So this is uh, referencing, that quote in particular is referencing the old apartment building that Theo used to live in with his mother. So when he gets back to New York, he sees that it's being remodeled <laughs> and he's like, to these sleek contemporary, you know, cookie cutter apartments. Yeah, they're beautiful luxury apartments, but they all look the same. All of the old details are gone and the history is gone, right? There's history in certain um, features in a home or in a building. You can look at certain features like crown molding and marble and the patterns of the, on the tile and say, oh, this was probably a circa like, you know, mid, you know, 1920s or 1850s, right? But now everything looks the same. This shows how we live in a society that is so willing to tear up the old, but for what? At what expense? So I would say that after the idea, the theme of grief and death, fate is probably the theme that would come in second. So the idea of fate runs throughout the Goldfinch from like page three. <laughs> and Tart is asking these larger questions. If there are things that occur. Sorry, if that there, if, what is she asking? She's asking that if there are hints, fate, being thrown at us to give us a heads up about certain events to come, like foreshadow. And if so, does that mean that coincidences actually exist? Are all, or are all things being woven together into a larger narrative? that you can't, it's, it's in, once it's in motion, it's set in motion. I'd like to think of myself as a perceptive person, as I suppose we all do. And in setting all this down, it's tempting to pencil a shadow gliding in overhead. So that's taken from the beginning of the novel where he's recounting that day, that infamous day of the accident. And he's making note of the weather, what they ate, what they didn't eat, what they do, things that slightly disturb the schedule. Are these are all of these a foreshadow or was this just destined to happen regardless? What held me fast in these brief library book accounts was the element of chance. You could study the connections for years and never work it out. It was all about things coming together, things falling apart, time warp. An act of God, that was what the insurance companies called it. Catastrophe so random or so arcane that there was otherwise no taking the measure of it. Probability was one thing, but some events so far outside the table that even insurance underwriters were compelled to haul in the supernatural in order to explain them. So again, this accident, you had to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, but because of this accident, it linked Theo with all these other people. It unlocked this chain of events. And that just, he gets wrapped up in these chain of events. And in some cases, it feels like he's being pushed with this current that he can't really control. That's where I'm going to leave it. Um, but before I say that, there is even a quote in the book. Where's the book? It's here. Where it's a, it says coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous. That was by Albert Einstein. Tart didn't quote. He, she didn't call out Einstein, but she used his quote. Um, again, it's just one of those things where like, do quit, are there such things as coincidences? And sometimes you look back in your life and say, I'm pretty sure we've all had these situations. You look back and say, that was so perfectly done because hindsight is 2020. You don't sometimes, you don't know where things are going until you're able to look back and see how it turned out and say, that was so perfectly done. There's no way I, in my humanity, I could have linked this together, right? There's just no way, it, 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 it was too perfect, right? And so, and by perfect, they don't always mean good. In some cases, yes, good, but just things just lined up and you're like, how did this happen at the right place at the right time? And so there are times when, yes, you act, you ask, who did that, right? So let's wrap up. Like I said, I tried to read this book in 2014 and couldn't get on with it. Just the wrong book for me at that time. I think one reason why this year, or late last year into this year, why I was able to get through the whole book was because I read it at the right time. 
it is a slow moving book for the most of it. You know, you, you start the book in New York, there's the incident, it happens pretty quickly. And then the end is this massive, it's very cinematic in a way, the end of it. But there's a lot of stuff in, in the middle that's just Theo's life from he, then he goes to Las Vegas. A lot of people fall out of the book by the Las Vegas sections because the Las Vegas sections aren't the spiciest. And by spicy, I just mean they're just not that exciting in a lot of ways. But it, it can be a little tedious to get through Las Vegas parts. But um, it's just a lot of his life and the people in his life and the decisions that he's making, the things that he's struggling with. And I can see how that could get boring. And I think because I read it in December when it was cold and cozy, I actually read the bulk of it on the two weeks that I was off between Christmas and New Year's at the end of the year where, you know, I didn't have to go to work because I was on leave and I, you know, I had purposely emptied out my calendar so I didn't have too much going on just to relax and it was just, and it was cold outside so I could just kind of snuggle up and read the book and just be quiet and relax and that is kind of the mood (laughs) for this book I think Donna Tartt is an excellent writer she's very smart you can tell that her writing is lush at times she's overly descriptive at in times but it works you know what I mean and you can tell that she's a fan of Dickens especially in this book you can tell that um perhaps she was inspired by some Dickensian a coming of age type uh stories like I think that reading this with oh my gosh what why is that book it's one of those Charles Dickens that is often it was Dickens actually also his personal favorite oh my gosh David Copperfield can't believe I blanked on that that was thinking hard times that I've never read hard times David Copperfield um just the struggle the struggle the struggle that poor kid he struggles quite a bit like a true Dickens character. Um, Theo struggles quite a bit. You can tell she was inspired by Dickens. And Tart Tart has stated that she is a fan of Dickens. There's just a moodiness that you get. And the scenes, my favorite setting in the book is actually when he's in the antique shop. It just feels like Dickens wrote it. It's dark and there's, it's wood and wax and candles and it's old and it's got, it smells like old furniture. And it's owned by this older gentleman who's a little quirky. It's a good time. I love that setting. This is also a very New York City novel. And so if you're a fan of the New York City novel, I think you'll enjoy this. You got to get past the Las Vegas sections, though. It's just such a stark contrast between the Vegas sections and the New York sections, as it should be, because those two climates and those two environments are are complete opposites. There are also, in true Tarte fashion, if you've read The Secret History, you know, there are so many references to books, music, and art, especially art and books here, because we have this piece of art that is still in the crux of of the plot. And you can also tell in this novel that Tart is also playing homage to a lot of the Russian uh, greats when it comes to the Russian, sorry, a lot of the Russian novelists. There is a character in this book. He's not Russian. He's Ukrainian, but he can speak Russian. And so, and he's read the Russians and Theo is drawn to a lot of these Russian authors because he, uh, because of this good friend of his named Boris. And I will say that at the end of the novel, this, the last few pages were overwritten. I think the ending of this novel is overwritten and tedious. It reminded me of how repetitive the epilogue and overwritten, I think, the epilogue of War and Peace is. Tolstoy spends this whole epilogue that should have been like 10 pages he makes it this whole section of him rehashing his philosophy that he's already hashed out in this 1000 page novel and you're like my boy my boy t stop we get it you've hit the hammer you you sorry you've hit the nail with the hammer like 20 times and we get it and tart kind of does that a bit and did she do this on purpose maybe but it was just too much i'm like we get it and it just felt 
overwritten. And you could tell like it was this philosophizing that you can get in a Dostoevsky, that you get in a Tolstoy. It was just too much. And maybe throw in a, a few pages of it, a few paragraphs, not even a few pages, a few paragraphs, wrap up the novel and get it going. She just went on and on to the point where it felt contrived to me and almost came across as cheesy. And so it was annoying. It was a bit heavy handed. And so by the end, the last few pages, I was like, oh my gosh, stop talking. But it still kept, it didn't keep me from reading the book as a four out of five. I still enjoyed it. And I'm glad I gave it another chance. I can't say I never would reread it. I might reread it. Who knows? I'll keep it on my shelves for sure. I still have Little Friend chilling. And I think we're overdue for a Tarte novel. She tends to write one every decade. So uh, Tarte is about that time. So we'll see. We'll see. Have you read The Goldfinch? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Again, this book is like Marmite for people. They either love it or they hate it. I know a lot of people who DNF this book. So please feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Also feel free to like, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram where we get up to more bookish shenanigans. I like to post, sorry, actually all of my book content goes there first. My book reviews go there first. And I post goofy things in the Instagram stories because I can. I will see you in the next one. Bye.